Without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce uh, the moderator for uh, this uh, second day of our forum, Teresita Silvia uh, Salud from the Philippines. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Tess, for agreeing to be uh, our moderator for the day. So for your information, Tess is the technical focal person of the Department of Education commitment to the Open Government Partnership for the Philippines. And since 2019, she is also the head of Secretariat of the Financial Management Reforms Committee in the Philippines, where she provides technical advice on the review of existing policies and formulation of new ones, including public financial management reform initiatives. Uh, she was also part of the team of officials in the Philippines that you have may heard of that have championed the inclusiveness and participatory budgeting in the Philippines, earning for the country high ratings in public participation under the Open Budget 2015 survey. So she is very much the person that we needed uh, for the two sessions of the day. And so Test, I'm very happy to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Noriel. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, we are pleased to welcome you to the second day of the International Forum on Open Government in Execution, Learning from Experience. Thank you for joining us around the world and across different zones, time zones rather. Uh, this session uh, will be divided into two segments. And uh, the first will focus on the team number three, which is using new technologies to facilitate citizen involvement, lessons learned, and experience. In the second segment, uh, we shift our focus to team number four, which is open government and accountability, making the link. Each of the two segments will feature the presentations of our distinguished panelists and discussers who have joined us today to share with us the insights gathered from their research studies that they have undertaken, as well as current and uh, perhaps the emerging challenges. They will help us to understand and appreciate why, how, and why this and how the principles of open government in education are applied. So this, of course, we know that the principles of transparency, accountability, and participation. I will introduce each panelist and discussion in its segment. And uh, every panel discussion we will be followed up by a question and answer round. And then we will have a 15-minute coffee break and then uh, for the, uh, the first segment. So let's proceed with our first segment. And this is about the digital technology. Digital technologies, the, the wide and the growing spectrum of the electronic systems, the tools, the devices, the resources that are used to generate process and process and store data, are said to have made the most impact on the world than any other innovation in history. Perhaps among the most notable of this impact is the empowerment of people resulting from improved communication and connectivity in most, if not at all, instances. This led to the positive transformation of society all because digital technology is properly applied. So in the area of governance, digital technologies have introduced new ways and opportunities for citizens to make their voices heard in the public sphere. They are information technology tools that encourage dialogues, exchanges between citizens and government, between constituencies, and the government of, at the local level, meaning the sub-national level from the local public authorities of that and amongst themselves. And bringing this down to the education sector, digital technologies have opened new paths and processes involving the pursuit of our objectives in school. So uh, there will be two case studies uh, that will be presented in this 
on this theme and based on the results of studies done in Ukraine and Colombia. But before we listen to the presentation, uh, we would like to welcome again Dr. Maria, who will provide us the international office. Dr. Muriel is a program specialist at the IIEP, and she is currently leading the Institute of Research and Open Government in Education Sector. Dr. Muriel, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tess. Uh, so just as yesterday, I will make a very brief introduction on the topics from the day, just to give you some kind of broad overview uh, of uh, of the, the research that have been uh, carried out by IP over the past uh, four years, and specifically on this topic on how to use new technologies to facilitate citizen uh, involvement. Well, as you see uh, on this slide, uh, it is clear that as this is the case for other public sectors, education sector is now a sector where there is a lot of digital citizen participation tools that are developing. And in fact, ourselves, we were quite surprised about the diversity of them that are now developing within the education sector at different levels of the system. Among those, uh, well, open data first, sharing a number of information, including uh, from the school, through website, uh, especially, uh, that exists much more than it used to be the case uh, before. Online platforms where all kinds of information, including regarding more recent clothes, more recent statistics, more recent reports, audit reports, and so on, are also made available to the citizens. But also new systems of online consultation of citizens whenever a new reform is to be developed. Annotation platforms when a new law, for instance, is going to be adopted for, to make it possible for different people at the same time to provide their comments and their inputs. Also, online platforms of crowdsourcing, trying, as this is illustrated by this drawing here, to put the collective intelligence of everyone together to find out good solutions uh, for uh, the benefits of the education sector. But then one of the questions raised is, well, with all of those tools developing, well, how much they can be applied uh, within the education sector and with what uh, success? So here, as you've seen, I've put a quotation from you and Robinson mentioning that, well, obviously, well, open government can exist without ICT tools and online platforms. As you can read, open government, open data can each exist without the other. A government can be open government in the sense of being transparent, even if it does not embrace new technology. And on the opposite, a government can provide open data and use technologies on politically neutral topic, even as it uh, even as it remains deeply opaque and accountable. So obviously, use of ICTs is not an equivalent to being transparent and to try to promote open government in the educational field. Also, there are some uh, restrictions in the literature, and you see a, a, and another quote from Linders and Wilson mentioning that obviously ICT can have great potential to strengthen access and provide opportunities to participate, but it can also bring a new form of exclusion for those who are on the wrong side of the digital divide. So we know all of this caveat and all those limits, but at the same time, I think there is a, rea a reality in the educational field that all of these new technologies now are made available in a much more easy way and user-friendly way that it used to be in the past. And more and more people are realizing, including in the education sector, that IC-based open data and e-government as a goal doesn't work, and that we need to go beyond that and to look for interesting use of technology as a possible tool for problem solving. And in fact, the two cases that we, we will hear uh, from the colleagues uh, from uh, Ukraine and uh, from Colombia just after my presentation will be a good illustration of it. So just a few figures uh, that I wanted uh, to share with you out from the global survey that we carried out in about 40 countries on uh, open government uh, issues. One of the questions that we raised through the survey was the following. Where can you access information about open government initiatives? 
And uh, here you've got uh, the results uh, from uh, four countries, in fact, uh, Colombia, India, Madagascar, and Ukraine. And you see that, well, in all those four countries, in fact, attending school meetings is still one of the preferred way of most people to have access to information, not talking about ICTs. But in some countries, and I think, for instance, on this graph, it is clear with the yellow bar that you see that corresponds to Ukraine, that in some countries, use of websites through use of emailings, use of social media is also now something that is developing more and more uh, in support to open government initiative. Hence, uh, the importance of paying more uh, interest to it, even though, of course, there is large difference between countries and also among countries, obviously, uh, between different types of group of stakeholders, certainly by socioeconomic group, but also clearly by age group. And so this is an, another graph that is coming out from this global survey that I was just mentioning, where we ask the people, what is your preferred communication methods to access information uh, on open government uh, initiatives. And you see here the responses by age group. And you see that, well, more or less, you know, the, the dark um, blue ones that you have here uh, accessing information through public meetings is clearly the preferred way, for instance, for the people between 30 and 50 and even more for those over 50. But then if you have a look at the people that are less than 30, it's clearly not the preferred one. And uh, online consultations or use of social media are coming much higher, which means what? Which means that also the young generation of public administrators that are playing a key role in the education sector have different and other ways uh, to access information. And certainly this is something that uh, we need to take uh, into account. Then a last uh, graph that I wanted to share with you, again, coming out from the case studies uh, developed as part of this work in Ukraine, Madagascar, and India and Colombia, where we asked people, where can you give feedback about uh, these initiatives? Well, you see that in most of the countries directly to teachers. So again, the direct communication is still used much more frequently than other type of access using ICTs. But again, uh, there is some kind of even a small percentage, but still significant percentage that are trying to access information in different ways. And here again, uh, in specific countries like uh, Ukraine, as we will hear immediately now from my colleague uh, Oksana. So just a few insights uh, from the different uh, country case studies and global surveys on this issue of use of ICTs. And then based on that, I think we can move on to the first presentation with your agreement test, which would be the one from, uh, from Oksana. Thank you very much again, Dr. Maria. Uh, this has been a very, very comprehensive presentation you have on the global perspective. So I'd just like to pose a question. What benefits do we get from establishing a system participatory mechanism to address the effective and efficient contribution or distribution of resources and consequently build better conditions for students, for our learners and schools. For answers to this and more, we are fortunate that we have us today, Dr. Rosanna Han, our first panelist who will share the Ukraine experience. She is a fellow a uh, research fellow at the Bologna University in Italy. Her research areas cover political corruption in hybrid regimes, the use of ICTS for fighting corruption, and open government in education. Let's all welcome Dr. Ha. Thank you very much, Dr. Ha. Thank you very much for this introduction. Very nice to be here and uh, congratulations to this uh, forum and su successful first day. I hope the second day will be as interesting as the first one. Um, I will jump right away in my presentation. I just need to test uh, the remote control uh, that we really promised. With the arrow, I think you, you should uh, 
You should be okay, Oksana. Okay. Just, so yeah. just moving the presentation. Okay, yeah. perfect. So today we will be speaking about the uh, platform that was developed in Ukraine, Open School Platform, and my colleague Alexandra Koidel presented yesterday already the role of local authorities in this uh, project. And today I will be speaking a little bit more about the technology and especially the process of implementation. And my message that uh, I would like to focus on today is that implementing technology for change uh, in the public sector is uh, something very different than implementing some small updates or small changes. And why is that? Because the complex of technology implement uh, the process of technology implementation is a very complex one. It needs to uh, include different stakeholders, different departments, because we are speaking here about the uh, change of standard operating procedures and change of uh, communication uh, channels that are going on uh, when the technology is introduced. And it results in the effect that actually the idea of technology is to support different processes and to make our life easier. But in the beginning, especially in the initial phase of technology implementation, it feels uh, like an opposite. It feels rather like a challenge that technology requires a lot of human resources time resources to be properly implemented and it needs an investment on the side of communication um, to be accepted by different stakeholders. And in terms of uh, accepting this technology, uh, the case of Ukraine is not necessarily the good practice because it's still a very fresh case. Uh, Open School has been implemented in 2017 and uh, in several schools and in those that we uh, studied in the uh, Donetsk uh, region. Uh, but in 2020, uh, the first version of the technology has been updated with a beta version and we still need to uh, follow up what is the impact of this uh, update. So to come to the case, um, to describe a little bit for those who missed yesterday the background, in Ukraine, uh, in 2014, we experienced revolution of dignity and the uh, change of the political regime. As a result, uh, many uh, legislatory acts has been introduced with regards to transparency. And there was a movement throughout the country against corruption and for transparency, citizen participation that is still ongoing. And uh, within of this moment, the sector of education wasn't uh, the exclusion. So if we um, analyze the problem that was there, so why open school was needed, first challenge was uh, a lot of corruption in schools. So 50% 50, 50 of um, people in Ukraine, according to a survey, uh, experienced uh, or perceived, perceived corruption in schools as a uh, widespread. But there is also a very high level of mistrust. So not necessarily the facts of corruption, but the mistrust that there might be corruption is even more important in this situation. Why is that? Because uh, schools are funded a lot by private donations of parents. And these private donations, they are taking place uh, usually in cash. It means that no one can control those uh, money flows. And where there is no control of money, there is a lot of assumption that there is misuse. And now the third problem is not only uh, corruption of mis mistrust, but there is also mismanagement of resources or funds because of problematic communication between executive uh, power, especially Department of Education on the local level and uh, school administration with regards to the needs and how the money need to be spent and what they are saving, what not. So if we move on to the technology as a response to these problems, to these challenges, Open School aimed at transparency. So in this context, the technology itself became the tool for accountability, where different stakeholders like civil society actors, but also parents, can control the flow of money. The second problem was uh, financial reporting and uh, schools, they um, 
became prescribed the law that uh, they have to report uh, all funding they are receiving and they are spending. So this reporting wasn't uh, regulated uh, specifically in which way the reporting needs to take place. So different schools were putting uh, the information on their websites. Some schools were putting the information in paper on the boards in the school, um, they reports. And some schools were reporting during the meetings where uh, parents were coming for the annual meeting at the school. So there were different ways and this technology, this open school platform aimed to unify the way for reporting and provide the schools with this tool where they all in the format of open data that is in line with the open data charter, the international one, that they put there the information about their finance that they are receiving and they are spending. So in this sense, um, the open school became a tool for data analysis and visualization, uh, which means that when we are speaking about transparency, one huge challenge is sometimes in misinterpretation of data or the ability, the capacity of citizens, of uh, parents to interpret a lot of data that they see. And the open school platform allows to visualize and to see right away all the numbers the different shares that I will show you in a minute. And the third uh, purpose of the platform was to create interaction and trust among stakeholders. And in these terms, uh, the platform fulfills the role of communication platform between schools, authorities and parents and private donors, because they can provide feedback to each other and also uh, comment on different transactions. Um, the second step in the technology is after, after the problem analysis or uh, challenges uh, listed is to develop the theory of change or the philosophy of the platform. And open school philosophy is based on the simple idea that all um, incoming funding and all spendings has to be connected to the needs. So technically, when the programming was, um, well, when the platform was programmed, uh, there were three categories that were provided for finance, to assign finance. So first category was the needs that schools communicate. And then what are the private donations and budget payments that are supposed to cover those needs or cover them already. So on the platform, as I told you, that uh, it's possible to visualize the data. Um, you can see on the left side, the chart that shows for what uh, services the school spent the money. And below there is a table that shows the granularity, how one can trace the money. So the person can see practically what was the need which school spent uh, how much money and for like whom did they pay, who won the tender or public procurement in this case and supplied uh, the school with the goods or services. So all this information is available and parents can uh, trace it, not only parents, but also authorities. When we asked uh, parents and school personnel, what do they believe is the value of open school? So what do they think, whether the platform effect was good uh, for? Uh, we got following picture that most of them said that uh, the platform open school allows better use of resources, financial and material ones, better allocation of, res uh, of resources and less corruption in schools. Um, the huge value of increasing trust was really important between different stakeholders. So parents and teachers, teachers were saying, and now I quote one, one teacher, as for the school, the result of uh, open school is an increasing respect for teachers. People will stop gossiping about the corruption of teachers who spend their children's money on themselves. And that was a huge problem. And now there is a hope that this platform allows to resolve it. Or what was interesting and surprising finding for us, 
that this um, platform improved even trust between teachers and school principals that there was mistrust that was quite surprising for us but now i uh, read the quote of one of the teachers this initiative has changed my attitude toward the authorities my confidence has increased because now i see everything that is happening with money when the principal makes a report i see that this is indeed true and the third a uh, channel where the trust was improved is between authorities, local authorities, and the schools. And uh, the same situation, the deputy mayor said, confirmed that um, the platform uh, helps to increase trust. Now, how this outcome was possible? The engagement of citizen, citizens uh, of the users of the platform was a critical point in this mechanism of improvement. And the users, especially uh, parents, teachers, and active uh, NGOs who are interested in uh, local education, they have following possibilities to engage through this platform. So first the possibility is to engage in accountability through monitoring. And they can monitor which school needs are covered by the local budget. Uh, why is that important? Because sometimes there is a lot of mistrust that uh, the school requires parents to pay money, let's say, for curtains, because this is a very typical case. And they asked for money from the uh, Department of Education also for the curtains. So it means that there is assumption that from two sources, one need is covered and no one knows um whether the money came or not and whether um the principal of the school let's say misused this money so this is the huge source of mistrust and with the platform parents can see okay there was a need for curtains it was covered by the department of education so there is no need for us to collect the money for this funding the second way is uh, that parents can see schools reports on the use of donation and the third way is to get uh, an overview of all information about income to the school budget. So they see uh, all the suppliers, all the tenders uh, that are connecting for uh, to spending money, and they con can control whether the procedures were uh, fair ones. The second cluster mechanism that technology enables to do is the, the engagement and the dialogue. And this is where we saw more challenges uh, because parents were not engaging so much, although the technology provides the possibility, the technical possibility for it. Uh, which possibilities are there is to find out, for example, what are open needs, because this allows parents to react, to collect money, to uh, organize some event, charity event, where they collect maybe money from some private donors, because many schools, they don't have sufficient funding from the local uh, authorities from the poor communities. The second way to engage here is to participate in prior to, uh, prioritizing the needs of the school. So the engagement procedure is that uh, the school administration publishes the needs and parents can vote what they think is shed, should be in the priority. What is the main need they have? And the third way is to cover school needs through private donations, as I described previously, through online payments. Uh, then parents can also support schools in fundraising campaigns and conduct a, a dialogue with the school administration because they have the function on this platform to comment and to uh, contact directly the administration. Uh, now everything looks very pink and nicely uh, until we get to the um, way how the technology actually works. And as I mentioned, there are uh, some challenges. And now I want to quote a teacher uh, who said, there was some distrust that open school would work. We set out needs, tried to work with it, but we knew that parents would not visit open school. Our fears were confirmed because of parents, because our parents were not interested. 
Since parents raise money in cash, putting information on open school is an extra job. So there are many challenges for the use of technology. Putting technology in place does it mean that everyone knows about it and that everyone will use it. And the third thing is uh, that not everyone uses it in a proper way. The main challenges for the implementation of technology or acceptance of it was um, previously no use of technology in the standard operating procedures that people had in place. Um, practically, it means that among parents, but also in the school personnel, there was low IT literacy and people were kind of technically afraid of the use of this online platform. The second source of uh, was um, the second challenge was uh, the mistrust of technology and especially of online payments, because many uh, parents, they did not trust to online payments at all and online payments were possible via the open school platform so they um, were afraid that the data, their data will be stolen their accounts will be empty they just didn't trust uh, and the third point is lack of professional human resources which is then lack of it literacy uh, among the school staff who did um, introduce all the data uh, in the um, in the platform uh, manually. The part of the data, uh, this is the important point that I didn't mention before, part of the data was uh, generated on the national level about the budgetary payments and the payments that Department of Education on the local level does for the school, individual school. It is then generated in the public uh, platform for open data on the national level and through the API connector, this data came uh, was transferred in the open school uh, platform itself. But a part of the data that donations are coming about donations and the spendings that the school does based on donations had to be introduced in the platform manually by uh, school personnel and there were many problems and complaints that they didn't know how to do it had technical problems with that now the second block of challenges is the standard operating procedures in place which means that people have their ways they are used to and as i told you in the beginning uh, many schools had already their ways to do reports is it on paper um, hanging in the school or uh, orally during the meetings with the uh, parents. So they did their job, they uh, had their flow, how they um, report about uh, funding. So they didn't bother to do it in the open uh, data format. Uh, and the second challenge within this cluster is that most schools, they do not have financial authority, so they technically were not able to uh, receive money, the online donations that parents did, which meant that, again, parents would need to go uh, and give money in cash, and uh, then uh, the school administrators enter the data manually in the uh, platform, which was a lot of additional work. And the third point is lack of motivation among users because key stakeholders like parents, they didn't feel ownership about the platform. They didn't know about the platform sometimes. And because there was no central implementation of the technology, so it wasn't, it didn't came from the national level, but it came from the civil society in cooperation with the local authority. Uh, because of this, there were problems who is responsible for what. So who has to push uh, this technology and communicate about, the, uh, about it? So this resulted in the low awareness about technology and some indifference. So come, uh, to come to the conclusion, uh, which recommendations we did from some um, cases that were standing out and they were that were successful with the implementation of open school because many schools were not so successful with that but some of them were uh, what was in place what other schools didn't have or other uh, communities and first of all 
during the implementation, the successful communities who had open school, who used open school uh, and profited from that, they had collaboration about the, uh, among different stakeholders. So um, they had clearly divided responsibilities. They engaged civil society organizations who informed parents, but also schools were on board together with teachers and um, principals were engaged and uh, the Department of Education and political uh, staff from the mayor and below, they were on board and they were in favor of the technology. So all this, this triangle was, was crucial. If someone was missing in the triangle, then we had the cases that were not successful. Uh, the second part um, is the information strategy is really crucial when implementing te technology. Um, and information strategy includes having a campaign among regular users who also inform about advantages of, of technologies, because especially in this uh, initial stage where there is a lot of investment needed that technology is accepted. In this stage, many are dropping out and um, successful communication uh, and active uh, communication campaign is important to keep uh, up the idea why are we doing all these efforts and introducing this technology. And the final and uh, also crucial point is providing training, training for users and administrators of the technology that is possible, uh, has been conducted face to face, or some uh, organizations, they did a video, uh, short videos that users were able to use in order to get uh, acquainted with the technology. So I would like to leave you with this, uh, message that implementing technology requires not only learning on the individual level, but also the adjustment of standard operating procedures that are really difficult to change, which means that there is uh, having technology is not the end, uh, but to embrace it, one needs to um, come and did some systematic change. Thanks a lot. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Hush, for that very insightful presentation. I, I guess in the view when we are one saying that the big data will certainly not contribute to informed decisions for planners and our implementers of programs. For indeed, we cannot improve what we cannot measure, as what Peter Drucker, the management guru, has said. So we move on to the next topic. The question is, how can we apply the principles of open procurement to ensure that our schools receive better products and services for the children, the students, the teachers, as well as the staff? Will the competition amongst suppliers generated by open procurement reflect a better planning process. Our next panelist will share with us the results of the study of open contracting for a school TV program in Bogota, Colombia. Dr. David Duque has been the Director General of Colombia Compres, a Presidente, the General Secretary of the Colombian Ministry of Information and Communications Technology, General Secretary of the Office of the Superintendent of Trade and Industry, Magistrate Judge for the Third Chamber of the Council of State, as well as the Secretary for Planning in the Capital District of Bogota, and Head of the Legal Department at the Colombian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has nearly 15 years of experience as a professor also of government procurement at the Del Rosario University for more than 10 years. Let's all welcome Dr. David Duque. Dr. David, thank you. Hola, buenos días para todos desde... Hi, and good morning, everyone. This is David Duque from Bogota in Colombia. And I'm here to share with you our experience with open procurement in terms of school 
feeding plants in Bogota. Here we had the chance of analyzing with the UNESCO the open data we had in order to develop our processes elsewhere in Colombia. That also allowed us to iterate the same project in other sectors of Colombia. Let me see how the remote works here. Okay, so we aimed at solving a number of issues among which the excess of absenteeism that we saw on the student's side because they were not fed properly. Part of the need to have a school feeding program came from the fact that the only meal that they would have, given that they were children in extreme poverty conditions, would come from the school feeding program. So that led to high malnourishment indexes, a high index of dropouts, and they're not finishing their courses. So all procurement processes were carried out in a closed fashion. The logistics was very hard. It was very difficult to be able to get through to the end of the process and to get the meals to all schools. So not many contractors could do that. And that was what we wanted to reconsider based on the information that we gathered. So we first separated our processes. On the one hand, we wanted to have someone who took care of producing the food which was to be stocked at some warehouse, somewhere. And then through a different contracting process, we wanted to find a contractor who would take care of the logistics to get those meals from those warehouses, to get them packed and to deliver them at the schools at the right time. So the system that allowed us to generate this change actually allowed for greater involvement in processes. So for those who sold food, for those who were knowledgeable in terms of logistics and delivery, and to get the meals where they were needed. Those people are experts in logistics exclusively. So this way, by dividing the process, we could capture the attention, we could attract the attention of those who are bigger companies that would then get involved in the process. Next slide. Okay, so the use of the open information would allow for the system and the contracting methods to bring reassurance to parents, to school principals, to convey the information to the students in simple terms. And from the monitoring viewpoint, we wanted to get the information to those entities that control the use and allocation of public funds. So they would now have all the information necessary to check that the contracting processes were as they should be. So first, we decided the meals needed to meet certain nutritional conditions, but they needed to be competitive and not only favor some of the suppliers in some cases, but rather that all suppliers should be capable of suggesting different possibilities, always with a view uh, to meeting the nutritional needs of the children, whether they be sandwiches, biscuits, or something else or yogurt the idea was to meet those nutritional needs with whatever product they wanted to offer 
And so the dress district secretariat would then get the meals and the information to the areas that were more remote from the warehouses. And the idea was to consider both costs, quality, information, but also the conditions in which the meals would get once they were transported to those remote areas, that everything was compliant with the standards we had met. So then we had to ask the suppliers and the contractors to consider whether there were traffic issues in the area. So in that case, they needed to have an alternative because in that case, if they saw that they would not be getting to a school in time, then the students would not be getting a meal that day because they wouldn't be fed at home either. So with all those measures, the parents, the schools, the teachers, the principals, and all those interested in getting the information were reassured because the information was public without needing to ask for it to the education ministry in Bogota. So thanks to open data, everyone could now access that information. I would also like to point out that the change in the contracting model was established through an alliance with the National Public Contracting Agency, which allowed us to have experts in food and experts in logistics who would both cross information to meet those contracting needs and improve the information. In our analysis, through the consulting that we undertook together with UNESCO, we carried out a number of interviews in order to find out what the level of perception of the school feeding program was, that is, to get to know what the students thought of it, what parents thought about it, what teachers considered it to be, it being a program with a rather high cost, which is near 1.5 billion Colombian pesos, which would roughly translate into 3 million euros. So it is quite a large program. In terms of developing and executing the contract, we now had good suppliers with better quality, with more experience in the development of their activities. And we also created these models of access to information for citizens so that when we performed our contract, those who wanted to access the information didn't have to request for it. They had the possibility of accessing it at any time. And we also created an office for citizen services so that the information could be conveyed to the suppliers and the secretariat in order to improve their controls. As I was saying, with a view to avoiding those informations that no longer depending depended on the supplier. That is, if there was traffic or there was a traffic jam on a given morning, if the supplier had to get the meals from point A to point B, but couldn't get there on account of traffic, then they would have alternate solutions. And that made for the excellence level. So in their vehicles, they also had GPS systems, which allowed us to follow them as they advanced. And that allowed the school to plan and to anticipate when the meals would get to the school. So when you have that experience, you can develop it much better. What's important about the process here is that the meals and the snacks were not only delivered in urban areas, but also in rural areas. There are rural areas in the city of Bogota, and the schools in those areas didn't probably had the possibility of accessing snacks because they were too far from the warehouses. 
Now with the new system, those new snacks could be delivered. We also saw that the need for the meals that were presented was that they be near to the food culture of the families. So th that the cheese had to be crafts made, that they had to be from small dairy farms, that we needed to favor some suppliers who produced good quality products and that given their the scale of their businesses, they wouldn't be able to deliver as many yogurts. But since we divided the program into areas, we could manage to get the meals and the snacks to reflect the needs and the culture of the families who were beneficiaries. The evolution of the process went from having suppliers who had to take care of everything, every step of the chain, to a division in the contracting processes into stages. On the one hand, food suppliers. On the other hand, logistics suppliers. What we saw previously was also that the chain had no intermediaries and the processes depended on one person alone, which made contracting risks higher. So if, if it was one company that was developing one job or one task, the level of risk that it could get to compliance would be higher. It, there was more risk that they wouldn't get there. Now, with diversifying the chain and with uniting small producers, we had the possibility of having other types of food, such as if the food supplier did not deliver what he had committed to deliver, if the logistics service went to the warehouse and the food was not there, then they would have the possibility of getting meals elsewhere with the contracting process already being developed. Contracting times and with the management of the system that we used to have, the market would be closed too soon. So if you had the suppliers who would sign long-term contracts to guarantee competitive prices, but the new methodology allows for an update of prices to follow inflation and for shorter terms. And with having shorter terms, we can adjust needs with those intermediaries in the contracting that we had made with Colombia Compra Eficiente, CC. So we once had one supplier, we now have open shopping with different suppliers. So whoever sold food could now be a part of the process before he had to ally with another supplier to make up a whole meal. So what we see in those cases is that fruit, processed food, yogurts, cheese, any dairy could now be a part of the program with whatever they produced with their smaller volumes to create a varied meal or varied menu that would favor the quality of the process. This is made possible to have competition agreements or sanctions against those who had violated. And then we had up to 60 or 70 vendors that we never had before. Companies who, which are acknowledged on the market for dairy products or cookies, and now they are interested to participate because they re think these are reliable because of the technology um, the tools that are being used so that they can introduce and table the um, proposals and not being rejected simply because they have not participated. This is because we see a good progress because now the prices are better because uh, the products are diverse. The prices therefore reflect the cost of the market and which in turn has a number of advantages when seeing these contractual parts and they are being used in, in different places in Bogota for this to be an example in their development. Now, uh, st stemming from the electronic uh, system, which is called SECO, 
which is the electronic system public uh, hiring, the, uh, the information has to be published and the, inform the reports have to be made when uh, they are saying what the menus are, what are the contract conditions, and all information is available for those who want to control, especially for the parents, the students who are also carrying out some kind of an audit of what is being done on, this, uh, on the grounds that they are citizens as well. The this uh, is done in such a fashion that sometimes in considering the opinion and, and the complaints or suggestions made, a number of changes have been made, for example, to menus, routes or situations because these things happen and the citizens perceive that uh, uh, that before that this didn't take place. So. And when the information is available, it is open and that it is known by the different people involved leads to the program being seen from a different perspective. And uh, there is a perception of non-corruption. Before that, there was corruption, there was poor quality, parents and, uh, and teachers were not heard. And now all of these opinions are taken on board to have a system for the program to be more successful. Now, for the vendors, this brings about a number of benefits. Why? Well, because the change has led to the fact that according to the needs, there have been more purchase orders and also long-term contracts that lead to better quality, but also short term contracts for that are useful for the private sector. For example, I need so many yogurts, so many sandwiches, and this is a very short term proposal. They don't have to wait for a long term proposal to be put on paper and then the benefit has to be local, uh, located and this may be favoring somebody in particular and not to the market. So this brings about more transparency and better competition, for example, there are more than 60 or 70 companies that are providing, for example, food, and it, it varies over time, and therefore it is much more varied. We also have um, protection mechanisms considering the, uh, collu the, the, the collusion that may happen between different uh, uh, vendors to avoid that. And we can see that if there, if there are big differences in prices, they can be uh, claimed or they can be mentioned for those authorities that are in charge of following that and monitoring that. Also, for the vendors, it is a possibility of growing because they make it possible for their business to grow and to generate new markets. Because once they have been able to sell in greater quantities, they can go and grow to other places, improving their processes. And, and therefore, the city of Bogota can also find the best vendors in the city. The efficiency of hiring is much bigger, it's quicker, and it, and it, is, it makes it much more efficient for everybody because it's simply it's an international standard of which is demand aggregation mechanisms that provides for coefficients, general um, parameters for the authorities to follow, which in turn will lead to other authorities, other places to find the same solutions following the same mechanisms in some other places. Now, in the considering the sanctions or fines, it is much easier to see where the problem lies. Production, supply, equipment, packaging, logistics, etc. There again, it will allow for the vendors not to say, well, it's not my responsibility because I did what I had to, because it, here there is a traceability of who would be uh, blamed, so to speak, for something that has not been delivered in due course. 
and we have mechanisms not only for fines but also to make sure that we actually enhance the delivery of the products whenever they have to be delivered. This has also led to big uh, impacts on direct and indirect jobs every time this kind of company can grow because many of them de depend on on very S, uh, SME type um, structures. Among the objectives that we find in this program, we will see the strengthening of uh, the funding strategy because they are better focused it is not anymore a very big bag where nobody knows what goes in and what goes out it brings about more transparency and because they are followed through out the contracting process we have a greater coverage and the um, food quality and safety process is continuous because before they used to end to start too late and according to the budget of the company because some some schools had a yearly year budget others had only three months that was the problems that we ran into by having different systems and the idea was that the state was not doing things properly it also allows for a better food quality and safety as i said before and to propose operational models that will strengthen regional authorities and, and make better uh, use of systems at a nationwide level. And uh, avoid the fact that, well, this is the way it is, we have no other solution. And this is very important from a social and environmental uh, point of view, because now we are moving, for example, the fact that the vehicles were that being used must have a, a process whereby they are either electric or in gas and not contaminating or polluting the environment of the place where they are delivering their goods. This is moving one step ahead, even though they may be more expensive. The same for production stages of the um, food that they have the procedure that will improve the environment and social uh, situation when they have to and hire. David, if you can uh, close in one minute so that we can have some time for discussion, please. Yes, of course, Maria. Thank you. Can you move ahead, please, with the next slide? Thank you. As a conclusion, I have mentioned most of this. It is the importance of, in spite of the difficulties of the process, we may have different mechanisms and types of contracts that can improve the market conditions to understand that the food for schools are very important for a city like Bogota because of the poverty in public education. And that the quality of uh, foodstuffs makes it possible to provide dignity to those who are receiving food. You have to give it properly. This has also changed the perception. And because these processes are this way, they will be used in the future. Bogota will never have a non-efficient process because parents now have been used to it. The schools have been used to it. They will have better conditions. And this is something that has no way back. Thank you. To, thanks to the information that is also found on the open uh, government uh, um, uh, information systems and we will not go back well, this is the end of my presentation thank you very much thank you very much dr david Duque. this time around our discussion for this segment 
es Vivian Suerte Cortez, also from the Philippines. Vivian is currently a consultant for the thematic policy areas of the Open Government Partnership. Prior to joining the OGP, she worked with Hero Southeast Asia and managed the Philippine portfolio of the Open Up Contracting and the Making All Voices Count program. She also worked with the Affiliated Network for Social Accountability in East Asia and the Pacific, where she and her team successfully advocated for the institutionalization of the Citizens Participatory Audit Program in the Philippine Commission of Audit. Of course, she is also involved in the education sector, where she worked closely with our Department of Education as part of the Procurement Watch Program, wherein she was part of a team that the procurement and she took, uh, say, in terms of monitoring the delivery of services and even the infrastructure in several schools. So let us all welcome Bien. Hello, Bien. How are you? Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Ms. Tess. It's an honor to be sharing the panel with you two. And um, having a familiar face is, is very good, more so because we've been um, working uh, to advocate for open government for the past uh, couple of years already. So. Um, and I would like to thank and congratulate our wonderful researchers, Oksana and David. The case studies you've written are inspiring stories that basically demonstrate that progress is possible, even in very challenging situations, more so when civil society coordinates well and when governments work with them in good faith. So allow me to weave some of the key takeaways. Um, I've read from the case studies that you've shared and um, bring them together with the OGP community's experience on the use of technology to facilitate citizen involvement. So um, some of the lessons, for instance, that, that really struck me would be first is that transparency fuels better accountability. So accountability institutions and incentives for better performance and efficiency are critical, but without adequate data to inform decisions, it is difficult to understand if, where, and how they are improving. So we don't have to look further than IEEP's case study on the online budgetary platform that was developed to be part of the Open Schools Project in Ukraine. It was established as an accountability mechanism to address allegations of corruption and mistrust, but by publishing financial reports in open data format, stakeholders were able to access, analyze, and see whether donations from parents are spent based on what the school needed. Eventually, they were able to rebuild trust among the school authorities, parents, and private donors. Of course, it's still a work in progress, but then it would be, it's actually great to see um, milestones such as this happen and, and hoping that uh, we could and they could still progress moving forward. And then the second thing is that public engagement, especially at the school level, is one of the most promising means of achieving accountability. A number of OGP members have strengthened parent teacher administrator oversight at the local level to improve school performance and value for money in terms of inputs. Accountability is actually more sustainable when the rules establish and sustain public oversight institutions with strong mandates rather than having one off interventions. So the case study on Columbia school feeding program, I think drives the point further as it showed how the open contracting platform allowed for transparency and better public engagement by providing stakeholders, suppliers, and oversight bodies with first-hand information in real time. They were also able to understand and monitor the procurement process. And it also provided them the stakeholders with an opportunity 
to provide feedback in a continuous basis that resulted to better meals that were priced at fair market value. The third is that the impact of digital tools is only going to be as strong and efficient as the social systems on which they are built. Too often, technology designed by those in power will ultimately function to serve their own interests. If, conversely, we want to use technology to hold those in power to account, we must begin with transparency, participation, inclusion, and accountability in mind, and operationalize those considerations throughout the design and implementation of new tools. The City of Buenos Aires, which is an OGP local member, made a major step forward in its commitment to increase accountability and transparency in public works for education in their 2017 action plan. Their commitment centralized all data on major educational public works, developed a centralized platform to present that data, and importantly established a citizen monitoring mechanism to allow the public to ask about the progress, delays, and concerns. The fourth thing I wanted to highlight is that online tools and platforms will very frequently have to be complemented by other ways of engagement and access. Because a back end that can only be accessed in a certain way or meaningfully by certain people will not be able to live up to its promise of being a tool for citizens everywhere. So it is imperative that citizens like us to be able to understand and access tools that are built in a way that makes sense and seems natural. Otherwise, to reference the open budgets case study, the use of technologies can lead to inequalities in poor rural communities having low level of internet access or computer literacy, which basically further widens the digital divide. A similar case in point is the Kaduna state in Nigeria. It's government empowered citizens to track progress on major projects such as the construction of schools, hospitals and roads through the eyes and ears project. Using a mobile application, citizens were able to submit information and pictures concerning the status of projects in their communities, which in turn helped the government plan and allocate funding to projects more efficiently. According to the government, money is flowing to projects more quickly, the quality of work has improved, and citizen participation has shot up. However, even with this new application, some citizens, for example, those without access to a smartphone, were still unable to provide feedback. So to address this, Kaduna State used its first OGP action plan to expand opportunities to provide feedback on government projects. In partnership with civil society organizations, the government committed to create new channels for citizen feedback, including town hall meetings, roundtable discussions with media outlets. And they also held focused group discussions with women's groups, traditional leaders, people with disabilities, and others whose voices were at risk of being overpowered. The fifth lesson that um, I took away from the case studies is that most reform initiatives related to ICT focus on releasing data, but they also assume that the people, resources, and the ability exists to interpret the data. There is a need to build citizen capacities to access and analyze data. So the Philippines in its 2019 action plan acknowledged this and committed to creating a participatory technology platform to collect basic education inputs, such as the number of students and school infrastructure for rural schools. This initiative aimed to increase government data on schools far from urban centers 
and it built and strengthen the capacity of citizens to access and analyze school data in order to account for government investments in school infrastructure and resources. So in designing and using ICT tools to encourage citizen engagement, it would be helpful to keep in mind that citizens must and always be front and center. And in doing so, we need to ask ourselves whether ICT or technology-driven solutions are actually the right fixes to a problem. So it would help to ask some of these questions, for instance. So how can we ensure that spaces for engagement, particularly in ICT, facilitate inclusion of vulnerable groups? How can participation be managed or streamlined across local and national government departments that are involved in the agenda setting and service design processes such that participation is meaningful and inclusive, but also useful for governments? The second point is that data that we gather and monitor also needs to focus on learning as opposed to looking at just schools. This means focusing on student achievements and aligning incentives in that direction. So how could we address gaps in existing data collection, management, and publication frameworks to help us get what we need to make those informed decisions that can contribute to better learning outcomes? And the third focuses on information flows and closing feedback loops. So how can we manage and streamline this um, feedback loops in ways that allow governments to act upon the inputs received, not just in responding to individual queries or requests, but in initiating institutional policy or legal changes? How can we better assess citizen satisfaction with the actions taken? So finally, I just wanted to echo what Paul Massen said yesterday during his keynote address. The UNESCO IEEP Policy Forum is a very good space for our two communities, those who advocate for open government and education reformers to come together and identify reforms that we can explore and commit to. This is where the OGP platform can be used as it encourages countries and local jurisdictions to explore successful interventions like open contracting, open budgets, and open parliaments, and scale this up through co-created action plans. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bien. Long time no uh, Yeah. So at this time, I think we are open to uh, questions from our participants. And uh, I'd like to call in and you may switch on your microphone, uh, our participants, uh, participants from Togo, and then followed by one of our researchers, Jonathan. May we call our participants from Togo, please? Thank you. We had a participant from Togo who made a comment, wrote a comment in the chat box. Mr. Tsali from Togo, I think, with the link with regarding the link with Imis. Would you like to ask your question live by using your camera and activating your microphone, Mr. Tsali? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Well, thank you for everything. My question was the following. These applications which allow you to manage a citizen's involvement in the management of the education system are integrated into the EMIS system or whether these are separate applications. That's, that was my question. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Tsali. And Jonathan, you also had a question. I think you uh, sent uh, two questions. Do you want to ask your questions live? Yes. My question concerns, so one of the questions, my question concerned a school of uh, feeding at schools in Bogota because a lot of things were mentioned regarding tenders and contracting, generally speaking. And I was wondering whether concerning access to information specifically at the level of schools and civil society, generally speaking, whether you they had experiences of problems which had been identified either by the uh, school uh, actors regarding what they were supposed to receive or the parents or the students and whether they had any mechanism to deal with uh, these uh, complaints and how it how did that work that was my question regarding these uh, this uh, uh, presentation and I had asked because this concerned the other uh, systems of open contracting I uh, uh, heard about when I was in Honduras, they're low tech with no uh, intermediary and no technology. But that was not a question. It was just a contribution to uh, what you requested us to give you examples. And I would like to uh, thank da David for these elements and for his answer. Thank you very much. How about Jonathan? Merci Jonathan. Beaucoup. So I don't know if you want to pick up all the questions, or you want to give the floor back maybe to Oksana and Juan David to, to respond. Okay, so may we invite Oksana, Dr. Tanahash to respond and then followed by our uh, Dr. Duque. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure I understood correctly the first question. So whether the open school is a part of the uh, national system you meant, or whether it's separate. So no, it's school. about uh, the information system, Oksana. If it's uh, the information that is provided, more or less the general official information system yeah, that okay, is yeah. used for that, or it's different uh, data system that is built especially for the initiative. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So here are two things we have uh, in, in Ukraine, there is on the national level open data system that uh, shows reveals all the uh, information with regards to budgets of all levels of uh, national spendings on the national level, local level, regional level uh, cities. So if Department of Education spent some money for a certain school, this is all connected and goes into the uh, feeds this open data uh, platform that is on the national level. So there is this huge kind of information monster. But in addition to that, open school platform is something different, which is connected through API to this central uh, system on the national level to this open data system and takes only the information that records the schools. So one can check the data about certain school or certain uh, city, how much is the spending. So this is connected, but the open school platform is something different and it has been developed by a civil society organization and is implemented then together with the local government for individual schools that are open to take it or not. So this is voluntary system, but closely connected, uh, connected like through API to the national one, open data system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Duque, yes, sir. ¿Podrían traducirme la pregunta, por favor? El francés, si no, no me quedó muy claro. I didn't have, a, could I have a translation? Of, I wasn't very clear on the French. Could I have the question again? Says Dr. Duque. He didn't understand. No, 
puedo hacer en español. Si, ah, pero si bueno, si es Jonathan. Es es que... I will do it in Spanish. Thank you, Jonathan. The question was if after with the information that the program provides to schools and parents, whether there was experience of complaints of parents or students or principals of the schools or teachers who have identified irregularities and who would have talked about these and these complaints were they dealt with by the authorities in one way or another and how if this happened that was more or less the question that i had thank you very well yes there was a space opened up and quite a bit complaints but they improved the system the service improved and the complaints were focused more on something that i mentioned and having the possibility that the foods would be recognized by the cultural reality of the families for example and say to feed them things they weren't used to in the rural areas, for example, was a problem. The children would not be used to having those. They had more organic foodstuffs and improve better ingredients. So that served, for example, to update the knowledge of the contractor and the processes changed so the menus were more adapted to realities, improving also, for example, the routes, the logistic routes were improved by the professors and the deans and the parents and the parents and teachers associations to do follow up. And almost always in this type of space where there's congratulations, not just complaints, and that made them feel ownership because they never had it before. Um, parents used to send their children to school and they didn't know what foods they were getting the importance there was they were part of it they have ownership knowing about the menus what was happening what the processes were so that evolution was interesting to be able to achieve something that was a really great learning besides the suggestions and complaints the users made and these are reflected in better improvements Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Duque and uh, our friend Jonathan. Uh, any further questions that we get from the chat box or from the YouTube? I got something here from YouTube, if uh, I may uh, um, raise this question, and I think it's addressed to Dr. Hans. How does OS, or the Open School, provide a supportive learning environment for students? Uh, another question that could uh, resonate from this question would be how to use it, uh, the, the open uh, school platform via smartphone and the uh, social network to reach the maximum number of people. Thank you, Dr. Harish. Uh, thank you uh, for your question about uh, improving uh, the learning outcomes. Uh, I would like to cite what the head of Department of Education in one of the cities said. So this is the quote. The system brings trust between teachers and parents. And if it does, they work together to raise the child. If there is understanding and trust, a completely different educational process occurs. So here the uh, learning improvements, they are rather... In okay. <laughs> um, 
the here are learning improvements rather indirect that are uh, taking place and uh, they are coming from the trust the traces between teachers and uh, parents and i saw one more question there was about the cost of the uh, school of the open school platform so uh, this is one question from the chat how important was the investment made to establish open school uh, if I understood it correctly, so uh, there was about the technical development of it. And uh, just to mention the costs that were spent, these were not uh, that high because the first version of the platform costed like $2,000 and uh, the second version to develop uh, was around $20,000. Thank you for the response, uh, Dr. Marsh. Uh, any more questions we got from our Zoom? Uh, all right. I think that uh, would be all for our question and answer at this time, at the, at the moment. So thank you very much for uh, for all of us here present and uh, everyone for participating in the first segment. We will have a 15 minute coffee break and return to the next part of the session after 15 minutes. Thank you very much. See you later.
Mais ça me lève. Okay, Tess, we are live again, so we can start uh, this new session. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Maria. Welcome back to our second segment of our forum, uh, focusing on the open government and accountability, making the link. Again, let's welcome back Dr. Maria for your international overview. Thank you. So thanks a lot, uh, Tess. Well, again, I will uh, be making a short overview of what we have learned through this research on open government and accountability. And uh, well, provide especially maybe some definitions and conceptual approach to this difficult con uh, concept of accountability before we jumped uh, into the panel session. As you see uh, on this screen, uh, we have a definition on accountability as it was designed as part of the Global Education Monitoring Report by UNESCO that was devoted on this topic of accountability in 2017. And as you see, they have defined it as a process aimed at helping actors meet responsibilities and reach goals. Individuals or institutions are obliged on the basis of a legal, political, social, moral justification to provide an account of how they met clearly defined responsibility. But then the whole question is, well, how to make uh, public administration, especially in this case, accountable uh, to what's uh, going on with the education sector? We know that there are different forms of accountability, horizontal accountability, which is the kind of regular one uh, with uh, usual internal control and audit mechanisms that exist within the system. But really what we are focusing on uh, through this open government initiative is the other type of accountability, which is the vertical one, which in this case can be exerted by uh, citizens and school communities. Again, around this concept of accountability, before we jumped into uh, the full discussion of it, I think it can be of interest to make the distinctions between two different terms, answer answerability on the one hand and enforceability on the other hand. Answerability, entity obliged to report on its activities, while enforceability entity obliged to change behaviors or actions. And obviously, when talking about accountability, we see that the types of obligation in uh, as far as enforceability is concerned are much higher than those uh, related to answerability. So now, again, coming to some of the results uh, of the research that we have carried out at IP on this issue of open government, uh, as part of the global survey that we have led in about uh, 40 countries, one of the things that we have asked people is to provide a definition about what open government means uh, in their own context. And here you have the different type of words that they used uh, to design their own definition. You see that for engage goes very high, transparency goes very high, uh, citizen and citizen engagement also. But you see that accountability, which is just here in the middle, appears in much smaller terms, which means what? And this is also confirmed, but and another question that we raised as part of the survey, what are the main principles that you consider as being of particular importance when talking about open government in education? You see that the issue of transparency goes very high. Then you have citizen engagement and accountability comes only in the third uh, place which means that maybe also because many of these open government initiatives that we are talking uh, about are at the very early stage. For the time being, a lot of focus is provided on providing uh, public access to information, making sure that citizens are engaged and participate. But the 
last step and which is really what we want to achieve through all of this of accountability is not yet achieved and uh, is not uh, putting at least uh, first while in fact that's the priority uh, and another uh, result from this uh, same global survey, one of the questions that were raised were which strategies do public authorities use to ensure that action is taken based on citizen feedback? And uh, you see that at the very top of it, uh, kind of priority uh, strategies, mechanisms to share feedback or concern to relevant authorities, or putting in place channels for users to register complaints or providing detailed information on the responsibilities and deadlines of all parties. But when it comes to not only sharing of information or providing possibilities for citizens well, to raise complaints or to share some kind of feedback, but you really get into the system itself in terms of having more frequent supervision and check-ins within the sector, or more frequent internal performance reviews, or having punitive measures for missed deadlines and or subperformance, then it becomes much lower on, uh, on this scale. And another uh, results uh, in this case from uh, the case studies that were uh, carried out in Ukraine, Madagascar, India and Colombia that are being shared with you. One of the questions that was raised was, have you personally been affected by this initiative? You see that the percentage are not necessarily extremely high, in the, except in the case of India, and that's why it would be particularly interesting to hear uh, from Kiran uh, as part of the panel discussions why uh, the responses were so positive in the case of India. They are lower in the case of uh, other countries, but especially if we have a look at the issue related to trust, with people declaring, well, I have more trust that school resources will be spent in a good way, or I have more trust that decisions affecting the school respond to needs. Well, it appears quite high in some countries like Colombia that we have just heard, or also Ukraine that we have also just heard in the case uh, of, uh, of Oksana. And two last uh, results that I wanted to share with you from, uh, from those case studies. There were other uh, questions that were raised under this initiative. Education authorities are held accountable for malpractices and corrupt behaviors. Do you agree? Are you neutral or you disagree? Or under this initiative, the school administration is held accountable for its action and performance. And you see that all together, the results are quite positive. In fact, in all countries with some variations, again, uh, some kind of a high percentage of positive responses in the case of India and Ukraine, a bit lower in the case of other countries, but still quite high, meaning that people consider that through this type of process that is presented to you, there is more accountability that has been achieved in the system, which is a good sign and something that we would like to unpack um, when presenting uh, the two forthcoming case studies with you and having our discussion. And finally, I just wanted to share this extract from the case study of Oksana and Alexandra from, uh, from Ukraine. Uh, one of the things that they have tried to do is to build an accountability matrix as part of their case studies, making a distinction between different forms of accountability, I would say from immediate accountability, with, for instance, better defined responsibilities within the systems, up to well, communities empowered, anti-corruption policies adopted, allocation and use of resources modified, which clearly are different forms of accountability that are important to document as part of this type of initiatives. So I'm going to stop uh, here, Tess, uh, for this uh, short presentation, and uh, I'm giving you back uh, the floor to go to the next uh, step of this panel. Well, thank you, Dr. Muriel. So this time around, uh, I would say that uh, citizens have the right to participate in monitoring and evaluating the implementation of programs implemented for them. Social audit give a voice to the citizens and clearly they have a role to play in school. How is social audit applied in programs in India and why does it matter? Our first panelist for this segment will discuss with us the case study on social audits in India. Kiran Badi is a senior fellow at the Center for Policy Research in India. Her research focuses on governance issues, 
in elementary education, working to build systems of transparency, education, accountability, and community monitoring. She has focused on developing a methodology for conducting social audits of the Right to Education Act that includes funding local solutions through greater engagement with the lower bureaucracy. Let's all welcome Ms. Kiran Batty. Thank you. Over to you, Ms. Kiran. Thank you. Um... Thank you for uh, um, uh, giving me the opportunity to present in a little more detail um, my uh, uh, the, the, the social audit that was conducted uh, in India. Um, I'm going to uh, sort of focus on uh, these four major elements uh, that uh, constituted uh, the primary um, uh, factors around which the social audit was constructed and from which also we had the major learnings uh, at the end of the, uh, the period that the social audit was conducted. Uh, so unsurprisingly, uh, they correspond to what we have been talking about uh, since yesterday. Uh, uh, these are the four main uh, elements. Uh, the first one being, of course, transparency, which is perhaps the uh, sort of necessary condition in open governance. Uh, but I think what uh, our um, social audit highlighted was that it's not just uh, making information available, but it's also important to um, demystify or uh, kind of make it in a, make it appear in a more simplified fashion. Um, and that's the important thing because very often official information is available in a very obtuse kind of form, which citizens and people on the ground don't really understand very well. So you know, it's uh, so transparency is not just about making information available or having more open uh, access to information, but actually it requires uh, a kind of demystification as well. And in that uh, process, uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, there is need, in fact, to develop a communication strategy. And I will talk a little bit more about that uh, further on. The second uh, important element, again, being talked about uh, through yesterday is that of citizen participation and that the particip uh, participation must be based on trust, not just trust between uh, the, the citizens uh, but and the state, but also across uh, different citizens. So especially in, in countries like India, where there are uh, different social groups and a lot of hierarchies uh, within uh, a society. It is also important that all uh, people from all different strat strata are brought into the fold of the exercise and trust is developed between them as well. Uh, independence was another element uh, in terms of the citizen participation that was highlighted uh, because often there are powerful lobbies at the local level. They these uh, which are interested uh, have different interests within uh, provisioning, for instance, at the school level or other kinds of lobbies. Uh, and those need to be sort of managed in a developed in the social audit uh, program. A lot of care had to be taken that those lobbies, including political lobbies, were kept out and that the forum was able to uh, uh, function in, in a kind of independent manner. Uh, citizen state platforms for dialogue was another important aspect of participation, uh, which actually once the, uh, these dial uh, platforms started to um, become functional, we noticed that more and more citizens came forward. Initially, some that might have had a skepticism about uh, the validity or the you know, possibility of success through the social audit uh, became much more engaged and involved once they, uh, the platforms uh, actually got into uh, being. Accountability, which is sort of the focus of this um, uh, this panel, uh, I will talk a little bit more further on. We also developed an accountability matrix, um, which was very, very necessary because without it, the citizens had no idea uh, who was responsible for which element of their uh, uh, entitlement and what they could do about it. Again, through those platforms of citizen state engagement, also a kind of accountability was uh, established, which was different from formal uh, systems that an accountability matrix could have provided. And more important, most importantly, uh, for accountability, what was necessary was a follow up mechanism to establish the feedback loop. I think that's what, uh, and in that sense, that refers to the second aspect that uh, Muriel mentioned, which was enforceability. I think that, uh, you know, is part of the, uh, the, the, uh, the feedback loop that is important to establish if one is really to talk about 
in, uh, accountability in the full sense of the word. Uh, and the fourth element, which perhaps uh, has not been mentioned that much so far, is the need for institutionalizing these processes, um, especially at the subnational level. Uh, of course, establishing links with the national level, but uh, they need to be es uh, established in a much more formal and institutionalized, regularized way uh, for them to have sustainable impact. And very often, before that can happen, uh, you need a facilitating agency. It could be a ground level, you know, NGO or some other civil society group. It could be a university. It could be any other, uh, you know, uh, organizational uh, system. Uh, but citizens need a lot of hand holding before some of these ideas of transparency, accountability, even uh, sort of equal participation, are grounded within uh, within societies and communities. And very often, that hand holding can be provided by an intervening NGO or a civil society group. Uh, group. So before it's institutionalized within uh, the structures of governance, which is our ultimate goal, a facilitating agency often is required. And that uh, support to the facilitating agency, it was an important element uh, that came up during our uh, exercise of the social audit and the documentation that we did after that. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? I don't know, I'm not able to manage it from thank you so coming back to the issue of transparency which was the first element that i mentioned uh in addition to simplifying the official language uh another uh, element that came up was that very often the kind of information and data that is collected by government agencies is much more of relevance to the agency and that's collected, at least in the Indian case, is uh, often meant to, you know, uh, uh, to do comparisons, say, administration, and may not contain certain information that might be of much greater use to the local population. So, in addition to uh, came up, therefore, the need, and I think this was the point Paul uh, mentioned really need to develop data systems and data uh, collecting um, the systems that are locally relevant. So you have to collect data also that came out uh, uh, as part of the idea of having uh, of opening up uh, data for uh, local use. Awareness generation, as I said, um, especially since this was a social order of the right to education and uh, right to education act had been recently passed, a lot of people were not aware of what it was about and what the entitlements were. So uh, in addition to making uh, general data available, uh, also the entitlements within the act needed to be um, uh, you know, uh, made available to the people, uh, which was not part of, you know, sort of the, the program of the government in a sense, uh, or, or even a part of the official data uh, that the government was, uh, even if we asked for information that would be made available. So this kind of awareness generation had to be done literally from scratch. Uh, and in that, uh, uh, alongside, we found that we also do awareness generation We cannot hear you anymore, Kiran. Uh, I think it's a, a connection problem. If you have the possibility maybe to go closer to your Wi-Fi box or something, 
because we have a lot of problems to to hear you and there is a lot of cut in the in the connection sorry for that Are, are, are we going to proceed to... Uh... Well, maybe we can just wait one minute to see if uh, Kiahan is able to connect back. Let's see. Okay, in the meantime, uh, let me wait for a few minutes. Yeah, just see if she's able to connect back. I think she disconnected and she must be trying to reconnect again. So let's try to give her one minute. And if it doesn't work, we will move and give her back the floor afterwards. But maybe just wait one minute to check if we're able to give her, get her back. All right. Thank That's you. The, the beauty of ICTs. For, since the beginning, we have been very lucky eh, with people from uh, all over the world with good connections, but uh, there is always a moment where, where it happens. Usually it's when you have a session on uh, use of ICTs. Uh, finally, it was not on this one, but on the following one. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> the challenge there. Yeah. yeah. So Kiran, are you back? No. No, I think Kiran is on the field. She's uh, currently doing some data collection on the field uh, in India. So she is not based in, in Delhi uh, with her main office. So obviously the connection is uh, much more difficult in this context. I can see Kiran now on camera. Yeah, I think she's back. She's connecting herself with her mobile phone. Yeah, I'm doing it from my mobile phone. Is that ah, all right? Yeah, super. We can hear you very well, Kiran. It's much better. Okay. So we, okay. we are still on the, on the slide on transparency and communication. Oh, okay, great. Um, okay, okay. So I, as I was saying that the awareness generation is... Uh, an important part and so for that various communication strategies were employed uh, were needed actually because again there were different communities in different parts of the country you know which had different languages different idioms different ways of even uh, uh, you know uh, 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 different cultural practices for instance so if you go to the next slide um, we can see um, uh, you know uh, can you go to the next slide please I'll just give you a yeah so here uh, as you can see, different uh, modes of communication were uh, employed in order to get the message across. We had wall writings. Uh, we had even uh, like cycle rallies, uh, you know, with children that had uh, pamphlets and other messages that uh, they took uh, uh, to their homes or they would, you know, drive through their villages and talk to people, other children, people, children who were not in school uh, to give the message of the right to education and the possibilities uh, through government in, uh, initiatives uh, that could enable them to join school, etc. In the middle is a page from actually a locally produced newspaper that was brought out by the women's group uh, that was engaged in the social audit. It was in fact entirely run by women journalists uh, from, the from the local area. And they not only carried uh, information about the social audit, but also about uh, other incentives and uh, possibilities that were available through the uh, school education system. Uh, you know, of course, as I mentioned yesterday, we had the National School of Drama that chipped in uh, to provide, uh, to prepare various kinds of materials. And here is just a little uh, shot of one of the cultural events that they organized. Uh, and the last picture shows um, a kind of pictorial, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a banner that uh, was very popularly used in one of the states that we worked in, 
uh, where various messages were conveyed through pictures, you know, in community meetings, and somebody would uh, sort of tell a kind of story, and through that story and the pictures on the banner, uh, various messages were conveyed. So different, different uh, kinds of communication strategies to involve the people to get them to, you know, get the messages across in the manner that they were uh, used to receiving messages, which would resonate with them was a really very important part of this exercise because again i would uh, say that you know part of the open governance is really making the message and the uh, and, and and the information available in the manner that can be received by the communities and the people and in that i think a uh, cultural um uh, kind of expression really plays a very important role uh the next slide yeah so the other element uh, uh again that is of course been mentioned is citizen engagement and here we found that it was not just the parents or the school community, but going beyond uh, the parents was also uh, played an important part. So in, in the case of India, at the local level, you have the uh, you know panchayats, which are the third tier of government, and which have been given the responsibility to, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of for education, it is an, it's a subject that has been devolved to that level of government. So involved, involving members of the uh, panchayat, uh, also uh, created, um, uh, you know, not just awareness, but allowed others to participate as well. And there were uh, similarly other uh, groups uh, that were working on maybe other areas, but, uh, you know, for instance, it could have been people working, uh, you know, on, on hunger or livelihoods. There was, there's a very famous NREJ program. Uh, we uh, often engage people who were part of those um, programs as well. Um, and you know, give the links between education and those programs to get them to participate in, as well. Uh, very important, as I mentioned, was to ensure that women and people from the more marginal, the marginalized communication, uh, communities were given space. Uh, this was really an important element uh, of the whole exercise, and uh, special efforts had to be made uh, in order to do that. Um, uh, and the next slide, I'll show you some of the pictures that will give you a sense of how that was done. Um, but as I also mentioned earlier, so independence from political interference was really important. And that was a bit of a, a difficult task because as soon as the audit began, there were various uh, uh, political uh, lobbies, etc., that tried to intervene and uh, in the process. So managing that was a bit of a challenge, but it is an, it's a necessary aspect of uh, the whole uh, transparency and accountability agenda uh, that was there for, with the social audit. Building trust, again, that has been mentioned several times already. Uh, and again, in relation especially to teachers, that was a big, big learning because teachers tend to be the ones that are uh, typically the one, uh, you know, people who are uh, being held accountable. And while that remained the case, I think bringing them uh, into the fold of the issues that had to be collectively and collaboratively dealt with, I think really helped in allowing us to take the process forward. Otherwise, we might not have been able to uh, make much headway. And overall, that was the learning that, uh, you know, unless we do, because very often the social audits that had been done in other areas uh, tended to ad uh, adopt a much more uh, confrontationalist kind of a, uh, an approach, which has been uh, the tradition, so to speak, uh, with civil society, when it interacts with state, uh, with, with with states and governments, and but in education we found, especially because children are involved, and they can, there is the danger of some kind of backlash if one is uh, takes too hostile an approach towards those who are involved in the provision, and especially teachers. It was really, really important right from the beginning to establish that that was not the purpose of this exercise, and that it was to really collaborate with all stakeholders and collectively try to find solutions. Uh, next slide, please. And this, this is just, again, to give you uh, a sense of how uh, the community was uh, engaged with and, you know, no space literally was left uh, uh, that could be used in order to bring the community together and have conversations. Uh, there were women's groups. Uh, sometimes just women uh, were invited so that they would feel free to speak uh, and there would be no, you know, social or other pressures on them to, you know, not speak up. Uh, we also held separate meetings with children, sometimes older children. Um, meetings were held inside, meetings were held outside. You know, this helped to really create a lot of energy around um, the, the social audit, but also through that around the idea of their right to education and what that meant and how the citizens could be uh, more actively engaged in that. Uh, the next slide. 
no, I think it's before that, not this one. There are a couple more before, I think. Uh, it says plat before that, before that, no, even before that. Yeah. So the, these were two particular platforms uh, for citizen state engagement. Uh, somewhat different in nature that I thought I would highlight. The first one, which was the education dialogues in Hindi, it's called Shiksha Samvad. These were actually a, the, a very innovative um, uh, 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 system that was started only in this uh, social audit, where at the block and the district level, a kind of face-to-face -face meeting was organized in order for it to be actually a dialogue on education, actually a dialogue on education between the government officers as well and the citizens themselves, which would be parents, community members, teachers, and children. And this really was very, very uh, a successful and a very unique experiment because to have to be able to sit across a table with with government officials was a very uh, unusual thing for most citizens because typically they are knocking on their doors and often do not get a response. To actually get a, a seat at the table, so to speak, was a hugely empowering thing. And really, after this even after the first one was held, a lot more people came onto the platform and were willing to engage and participate in the social audit. And as I mentioned earlier, even in this uh, forum or this platform, uh, collaboration rather than confrontation was the mode and a lot of effort was made to ensure that that happened. Uh, the other important thing about this, uh, this particular platform was that it was regularized. It was meant to be held every month. And of the 10 states where the social audit was conducted, at least three of them passed orders, government orders at the state level uh, to ensure that it happened every month. And the regularity uh, meant that every time they met again, issues that had been discussed in the earlier months could be taken up again in a kind of follow-up fashion. So if some of the uh, problems were sorted out, that was reported. And the ones that continued to remain as problems and did not find a solution were brought up again in order to be dealt with uh, maybe in a different fashion or just to give it a little extra push so this the you know a kind of feedback loop got established um, through the through the fact that it was held in a regular uh, in a regular way every month the other uh, kind of citizen state engagement platform that was uh, also uh, took place were public hearings these were actually quasi judicial processes in which the national commission uh, which i mentioned yesterday has quasi judicial powers uh, was basically convened these public hearings. Uh, but in addition to members of the commission, um, uh, other uh, maybe civil society people, but also often retired judges uh, formed a kind of jury um, at the hearing, uh, and they would actually sort of hear complaints from citizens about, uh, you know, issues that had uh, were not sorted out or where entitlements were not met or whether there was corruption or any other kind of problem. And uh, since it was a kind of hearing, the officials responsible for the uh, the problems that were reported were actually summoned to the hearing. And uh, at the hearing itself, uh, uh, you know, some kind of solution had to be uh, sort of found. The officials had to give, for instance, a timeline or some other way in which that they were going to tackle the problem that the particular citizen had brought to the forum uh, to the hearing. Uh, these tended to be a little bit uh, less in dialogue mode. They tend because they were, you know, they were a hearing and there was a kind of judicial element to it, and a solution had to be found there and then by the official. Uh, and they were also therefore not sort of regularized in that sense. Uh, typically, they would be held maybe once a year or once in, uh, you know, a few months, um, where a collection of issues which had uh, not been able to be solved over a period of time could be. Uh, could be handled, but this was also another form uh, of state citizen dialogue, uh, citizen engagement, uh, which proved useful and uh, more useful in some states and not so useful in others. But both of them had uh, different kinds of value. Uh, the next slide, please. I think the next one is just uh, some pictures. No, it's not this one. Um, about this, it's a couple of pictures, I think. Uh huh. No, 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 this is the last slide. Can we go above these or I do you not have them? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, no, the one that just came. Yeah. Uh, 
no it's not this either i don't know maybe you may, do you not have it there are four pictures of that slide which is just basically giving you a sense yeah maybe yeah this one this is just a different platforms um uh, you know the shiksha the education dialogues and the other where i mean citizens got to put their uh, problems directly in front of the officials and expect some response uh you can go to the next one which says not just transparency but yeah so as i mentioned there was an accountability matrix that we really worked hard to build uh and i will show you that in the next slide uh because that was something that we confronted right away that people just didn't know where to go and how to who to approach if there was a problem at their school uh and uh, typically they would say that we we have we don't get a hearing and often it was the case that they were approaching or knocking on the wrong doors and then it uh, we discovered that actually within the system itself and even within the uh, right to education act it was not clear who was responsible for each of the different entitlements or for any of the incentives that were available to the students or for any of the other uh, things that one might expect at the school level and so you know typically a citizen would go from pillar to post and not get any kind of redress so fixing accountabilities for different entitlements at different levels of government really is a very very necessary part of any kind of accountability framework uh, that we can expect and um, so we worked at uh, building an, uh, an accountability matrix which i will show you in a bit uh, but it also meant when but while we were working on that one of the things that emerged was that uh you know whatever happens in a school is often not uh, only the responsibility of the education department there are so many different departments that must come together to provide all the elements at the level of the school and the biggest uh you know example of that was the water and sanitation uh, uh part of um, the system because you know having functional toilets in a school has become a very important issue even a political issue in india and it was very odd that very often the uh, education uh, data would show that there is a toilet but when you went to the, uh, to the school there would not be a functional toilet all that one would find is the four walls of the toilet but no water and sanitation system within it so uh, for all purposes it was not functional and actually what emerged was that the reason that was the case is that the four walls were to be built by the education department that was their responsibility and so once they built the walls they would sort of tick off that box but the water and sanitation department was responsible for everything else and there was no convergence or conversation between education and the water and sanitation department as a result of which you had a lot of dysfunctional toilets so a part of the whole accountability a building of the accountability matrix was to establish the convergence and make sure that the relevant uh, officials or the relevant departments were brought into the loop of the education uh, accountability matrix uh similarly um, establishing a follow up mechanism was really really important as i mentioned those month monthly dialogues did help to do that and uh, uh, you know those really we were only able to get the orders in a few states i think other states if they were to follow suit it would make a big difference but another unexpected uh, sort of consequence of uh, of this whole exercise was that um it started to once the accountability started to get fixed once there was some kind of uh, feedback loop established and solutions and results began to emerge uh, areas that were not covered by the social audit uh, got uh, got to hear about what was happening and they started to demand the same in their own areas even though they were not there was no formal social audit being con uh, conducted there they began to approach their officials Uh, at the local level and started to give the example of the neighboring district or the neighboring block uh, where the audit was con uh, conducted and where uh, answers were provided and accountability was fixed and they used exactly the same examples and said well in that district you know the teacher was held accountable by uh, so and so or the water and sanitation department was held accountable to make the toilets functional etc so you know we would like to have the same so this kind of creating an accountability just through the practice or the praxis in 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 the neighboring areas uh, also was uh, an interesting sort of side effect of um, of this and uh, you know among the results that uh, we started to see in the neighboring areas was teachers coming on time uh, and of course the community started to ask for social audits of their own uh, the next slide please yeah so this is just the uh, uh, one page Uh, in the accountability matrix that was uh, uh, constructed uh, during this exercise and what it shows on the left 
is the different um, you know sort of entitlements um, uh, that the act provided and actually the education so for instance the number of days that a school is supposed to be open uh, or who is you know or, or functional toilets as i mentioned uh, or um, you know uh, non compliance with uh, with teaching duties or non teaching duties etc the next column shows the person who is you know uh, is, is is supposed to make sure that that particular entitlement is provided uh, and then who is a supervisory officer of the person who is supposed to make the entitlement uh, provide the entitlement uh, what is the time frame within uh, that uh, within which the entitlement should be provided in case there is uh, there is a default on that and who is finally the uh, you know the last authority uh, who uh, to whom appeal can be made in case even after the, the time period has passed there is no action that is taken so this was just a way of kind of fixing at specific levels of, uh, with specific offici officials in the system um, all everything that one can expect from a school system uh, of course uh, unfortunately not uh, all the states uh, did prepare this uh, but this template is now available within the government and one can only hope that uh, sooner rather than later um, uh, it can be a sort of made universal uh, next slide so this is just sort of repeating in a sense uh, some of the information that uh, muriel shared we did have actually a very high response in terms of uh, what people felt about uh, accountability and um, you know as you can see um, parents uh, uh, smc members and community leaders in particular uh, felt that uh, during the social audit um, uh, you know there was a lot of accountability that was established with uh, the education officials in particular the teachers unfortunately as you can see were the least convinced i think some of their grievances uh, which uh, often could not actually be handled at the local level uh, were not, uh, I think, in their opinion, adequately addressed, which is why they had uh, they were not as convinced as the others about the accountability aspect. Uh, now, uh, moving on to the next uh, slide. Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, facilitation really uh, was uh, uh, came up as a very important element uh, in this process. Uh, these ideas of transparency, participation, accountability, etc are really, uh, they are important ideas. They are ideas that the community and people, parents uh, do understand, but they uh, are often very uh, clueless in terms of how to uh, go forward in it. And one of the things that um, we learned in this process was that uh, it's really important to be able to rigorously document the situation. Uh, often uh, complaints or problems are raised by members of the community, active members of the community, but in, 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 you know, very much in the form of a kind of anecdote. And they don't have all the relevant details available with them when they try to approach a state government office as well. And so part of the social audit process wa and the, the development of the methodology was, uh, you know, formats uh, that would help to document the situation in as much detail as possible. So that in the uh, platforms that were created and where the issues could be taken up, all the uh, you know it was a very detailed manner in which um, the issues were presented, which also made it very difficult for the officials to not respond to it. Uh, uh, often in earlier cases, they would be very dismissive because they would ask for bits of information, and if they didn't have it, they would you know therefore not respond. So when confronted with all the details, it was very hard for them to uh, turn away as well. Uh, but in order to uh, fill those formats or to be able to provide those uh, that kind of detailed information, a lot of training is required, and which is why also this facilitating agency is uh, is a necessary element of this process. Um, that can you know uh, play that role and sort of a, 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 a role in the in before uh, actually the whole process can be fully institutionalized within community. Uh, community organizations like uh, you know the school management committees or within the panchayats uh, they need to be trained uh, in some of these methods and processes uh, before they can actually take over so it's part of the kind of capacity building that was also mentioned yesterday that is needed for uh, the local groups and the local communities and that does require some investment uh, of a facilitating organization and those organizations typically do need to be paid um, so uh, th that that does involve a kind of budgetary, um, uh, an extra budgetary input uh, from the states in order to take that forward. 
Um, and uh, similarly, uh, uh, in addition to, be a, to uh, being able to prepare uh, the documentation, also making presentations uh, to state officials, and then how to follow up as well. So again, very detailed information on what has been done and what, is, uh, what remains to be done, et cetera, so that in the next meeting, uh, that can be very precisely and concretely presented uh, so that again you know it's hard for the uh, officials to not respond i think these uh, processes and these methods uh, do require a lot of investment in um, in time and training uh, and uh, therefore the help of uh, an organization that can do that um uh, the follow-up as well at higher levels so you know the reach of local citizens may not be too much beyond the local and, and if they are if they do need to go beyond whether it is uh, in terms of judicial recourse, uh, which did happen in a couple of cases, or even just up to the state's uh, Commission for Child Rights or the NCPCR, um, they again need some uh, handholding in a sense, they need support till the process is fully institutionalized and then they just have to go up the institutional ladder. Um, so I think these these were the main uh, 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 elements that came out uh, from, uh, from the social audit. Um, as I said, uh, it was it was a very successful exercise in establishing accountability. Um, and uh, uh, but I think unless it is institutionalized and unless uh, organizations are able to provide that kind of capacity building to communities, uh, it's not a process that is uh, easy to sustain uh, without that kind of support and capacity building. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kiran, for the very insightful uh, presentation. And uh, we see that the critical elements to make the social audit work are really, really, very really important. And uh, as I said, uh, the different actors were able to be, uh, of course, realized and they get to be mindful of their respective roles and also the accountability so that the programs indeed would be responsive to the needs of the school and all those uh, working within the education system. Thank you again, Kiran. Okay, let's move on to the next. And uh, this is about uh, the social management committees. Our next panelist will talk on the thematic study on school management committees in Sub-Saharan Africa. Jonathan Dupan is a development economist, has been supporting for the past 15 years various ministries for education, technical and financial partners, and their actions mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. So Jonathan has extensive experience in the design and management of international cooperation programs particularly in support of educational systems and technical and vocational education and training. Let's all welcome Jonathan. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, oui, okay. bonjour, uh, merci pour, uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for having given me the floor. Now, yesterday's presentation, I talked about the uh, school management committees uh, and the various uh, stakes. Today's presentation will focus on the accountability of uh, SMC school management committees. Uh, now I'm just going to give you an overview of the source of the study. Uh, but let me first of all talk about certain observations. We see that uh, the SMCs come in various uh, shapes and sizes, but they have a small common vision so that, that is to institutionalize uh, the idea of participation. So it's the idea is to bring together stakeholders in a single uh, decision making structure and depending on the country, they, uh, they, they, there's a lot of uh, nuance according to the balances. We've observed that one objective, uh, uh, objective is to nuance the absolute professional legitimacy of uh, the school principal. And, uh, but uh, it's 
for the members of the SMCs who have a democratic legitimacy because they're the ones who are elected to be elected representatives. We've also observed that uh, there has been limited appropriation by the stakeholders. Uh, we've identified uh, uh, shortcomings in text and implementation tools, and it's uh, difficult to have the right understanding uh, with uh, the uh, PTAs. So uh, we have uh, uh, difficult, uh, we have a limited understanding of arrangements and capacity for stakeholders. And uh, there are no text and implementation tools. Like, for instance, uh, the uh, tools like the accountability matrix in India is not there. And uh, people really do not have the possibility of playing a full role in SMCs, especially the uh, parents. The constitution of SMCs is also very difficult in terms of representativeness. Uh, so we've got uh, challenges of local democracy during elections. We really have the weight of tradition, and there is a power struggle. And we have we tend to uh, position community leaders in the key positions. And SMCs can really become hubs of power struggle because. Uh, they are a uh, battlefield amongst various stakeholders, uh, and uh, especially in the urban areas where parents uh, could have a different objective. And we can also have, in certain countries, political interference in uh, these uh, democratic, local democratic spaces. So. We've got a major stake here. Now we've got the risk of parental disinterest uh, because their participation in the SMCs uh, could be very time consuming because they're not paid for this. And uh, uh, they could be conflictual uh, attitudes either towards the teachers or other parents as well. So what happens is sometimes uh, we have uh, positions where people do uh, their job, the school does what it takes care of what happens in the school, and parents take care of things at home. And yesterday we made an observation that the missions uh, given to the SMCs are uh, of various kinds. The first one is the parents' contribution uh, to the school functioning. So this is a historical activity of the parent, which is not uh, uh, with compensation. So parents, in fact, uh, are asked to pay contributions, and the SMCs, the school management committees, can be seen as a new tool to extract funds from parents. And another mission is the managing the institution around a plan and uh, managing the resources. And again, these are very complex missions and could uh, require complex management assessment techniques, uh, mediation techniques, community management techniques, uh, and also knowledge of modern accounting and management systems. So the shifting of all those responsibilities uh, to the community does raise legitimate questions. And this is exactly what we were talking about yesterday. Uh, it's, do, does this give the community the required resources? And if the transfer does not happen properly, what is the next solution? And SMCs as a new stakeholder what is their uh, accountability, how accountable they are, and to whom. So today we're going to look at this in a more specific way. Now, uh, the first observation that I'd like to underline here is uh, the contribution to school operations is the prime mission of SMCs. And this is a major stake uh, in terms of accountability. 
Now, the financial and uh, material contribution of parents is a major trend and it's very important in certain countries and it could be as high as 50 percent of uh, uh, the education funding. So the SMCs is uh, presented as a tool or a structure that will uh, look, uh, that will find new financial contributions for the school, which is great. But in sub-Saharan Africa, the resources uh, that are available to the school is the resources of the parents. So there is a lack of consistency between sectorial objectives, which is uh, limiting parents' funding, because that is completely in contradiction with our objectives of equality and access to education. So uh, this sectorial objective is completely in confrontation with the objectives that we are giving the SMCs, which is about fundraising, getting more funds over and above public funding, because we realize that uh, it's uh, they will first turn to the parents uh, to get the funds. So uh, we really have to know that primary school is free in many countries. So schools do not have the right, theoretically, the right to ask uh, financial contributions from families. And uh, so uh, the SMCs actually create a link with uh, PTAs, so the, the SMCs will actually see that there are needs and they will ask uh, their partner, the PTAs, parent-teacher associations, uh, to contribute. Uh, so there are situations where one part of the budget of uh, PTAs is given to the SMCs, and if the SMCs are dysfunctional, then we are basically losing out on uh, the accounting of uh, the funds provided by the parents to the SMCs because they are basically managed, these funds are managed by the SMCs. So we've got this first problem, which in many schools in sub-Saharan Africa. Then uh, if you look at uh, the accountability with the schools. The first one is the members' ability to be aware of situations and to be involved in processes. So over and above the principle of government partnership and everything, the members of the SMCs should be accountable and they, they really need to have access to information. So here you've got uh, the Parents Association uh, testimonial, which is very uh, negative on access to information of by parents uh, and SMC members. Now there's also the challenge of uh, individual skills. Even though information is available, can we really steer, manage, and control the SMCs, and especially the parents? So uh, in Burkina Faso, for instance, we have a guide for uh, the SMCs. Uh, it's a 2016 edition. So the members of, have to develop uh, a holistic development plan and it should be inspired from the educational uh, sector documents and uh, they also need to have a change oriented approach in order to have a vision for change for the school where our values will be identified so it's quite complex uh, and uh, this is an approach which is extremely difficult to implement at the central level and uh, there is uh, underpinning paradigm paradigm which is uh, is very far from the communities l'autre mission de de gestion des ressources uh, concerning the other mission at the management of resources we are faced with um, 
modern accounting paradigm. For instance, in Burundi, the SMCs ask them to use the different uh, uh, tools like bank no, uh, notes, uh, photocopies of the checks, uh, uh, etc. All sorts of things which are a bit difficult to, to do for people who, in this context, uh, well, you have people who are illiterate, you have many illiterate people. And these uh, quite complex approaches are not necessarily in line with the national systems. A survey on subsidies to schools managed by SMCs notes that in Madagascar, in Togo and the DRC, the um, manuals regarding the management of uh, subsidies were developed in the framework of projects supported by external partners. And these part manuals have not been updated. And the training on the subsidies supported by technical and financial uh, partners uh, do not concern government subsidies. Of course, uh, this leads uh, to a question regarding the real ownership of participatory governance uh, in the national, amongst the national authorities. But it also means that there is a need for a community support to allow the SMCs uh, to uh, operate and the members to play their role. I just would like to rem uh, remind you of the conclusion of the previous uh, presentation. They said this coaching is often done by the NGOs uh, funding the project, or uh, it, it may just be ba based on the shoulders of the principal. So the role of the principal remains central and essential. Without support, we see, note that the uh, stakeholders in many environments, i.e. the parents and the SMC members, may end up being the people who just uh, uh, adopted the decisions made by uh, the principal. And here we have uh, the statement made by uh, in Ghana by uh, members stating that the examination is very complicated and I very often consider that uh, in most cases uh, uh, I'm not the one who should take the uh, position but uh, even uh, and i cannot mm, give my position even if this has been prepared by the principal of the school so they cannot really play that role in the case uh, where uh, this uh, functions uh, more or less uh, functions if there are difficulties and challenges what are the skills and capacities of the smc members and the community uh, to uh, uh, ask the the the, the, start, the school staff uh, to really feel responsible. So here we have a short circuit for a res a responsibility, which is quite limited. And the members of COGES, uh, of the SMCs, have no uh, uh, nothing to say about the recruitment and the promotion of the school staff. And we can take the example of all these uh, teachers paid by the parents who are f recruited by the, the parents. In a certain number of uh, contexts, there is no real alternative to find another the, uh, the uh, school principal or another direct uh, school principal if the SMC had the possibility to just fire these people. But this leads uh, to ask yourselves good questions about the status of the civil servants and the principals, etc. So we realize that we need a long accountability uh, circuit based on the administration, and we know that it may uh, um, not exist in some country that there may be collusions between principals and the members of the decentralized uh, services. And in addition, we have a local authority like a town hall, which is a uh, strong enough to act as a counterpower. So there is a real stake there, to, uh, and you should be able to work on the long accountability circuit. And we see that some information are given on regarding local examples where the challenge remains really important. So SMC could be a structure and we expect them to be a social structure and to discuss with at the other levels of the education sector, but we realize that there is very little action towards the other levels. And there is a, a survey from Transparency International in sub-Saharan African countries, in seven of them, it is uh, stated that the complaints mechanisms are never clear and parents uh, tend to complain when problems can be solved at the level of the school. So there are very few uh, people who, who adhere to the fact that the SMC could represent a useful interface uh, towards the other levels of the education system. 
and given all these uh, failures of the uh, uh, conventional uh, accountability circuit within the administration. And one last point now, which has been raised in this uh, study, is that SMC becomes an, a, a, a player, an entity, and you may wonder about the accountability of the executive uh, or the committee, the management committee, towards the community and dedication community, generally speaking. Once again, we imagine that if the members of uh, the SMC members who have been elected may have problems in playing their roles, we understand then that the, the skills and capacities of the other members of the community may also be limited uh, and the, the, to uh, the, allow them to play their role uh, in, uh, regarding accountability when uh, the SMC comes to present uh, their work uh, to the General Assembly. So the relationship between the SMCs and the community uh, may turn into pseudo information moments where the members, when the members of the community only uh, uh, adopt what the uh, SMC uh, has done. Here you can see a comment of the uh, parents, uh, teachers, uh, the parents of the students uh, regarding what happens at the level of the General Assembly. Now, the accountability of the SMCs towards the external world, if the challenges have been identified, when you talk about the SMC, you do not know exactly what you're dealing with. As to the staff of the civil servants, the principles, uh, the rules are clear because they have to obey by the rules of the uh, public administration, even if they're not uh, uh, properly uh, implemented. But for the president of the SMC, what are the, the responsibilities of this president? They, for he or she is only a member of the community who has dedicated some time to help the school uh, uh, function. And a, a survey of Transparency International showed that none of the seven countries surveyed had established sanctions for head teachers or SMCs responsible for poor performances. Uh, only the Cote d'Ivoire, in its uh, decree, uh, stated that any uh, problem regarding uh, the management of the MSMC may lead to uh, problems, but they will not be, but people would not be taken before the courts. So we have a little bit more details about the way you can lead the other members to play their role and responsibilities. So apart from uh, just not re-electing them. Beyond that, I would just make a link to with Europe because this uh, issue the new models of governance for uh, public services, particularly at, at the local level, uh, concern all countries, because this is an international de 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 development and trend. In 2008, an OECD study showed that, that in Hungary and Ireland, the legal responsibilities of boards of directors have increased in recent years, and parents aware of this increase are less and less willing to serve on these boards. So you can see that when you really decided to deal with the responsibility and accountability With regarding the accountability framework in the sector of education. So these are just as suggestions uh, proposed by the, this uh, study regarding the efficiency of SMCs. So the first one, the first proposal would be to differentiate the operation of SMC as a governance structure and separate that from volunteer activities and other parents' contributions. <coughs> because it might be considered as a new space for the financial functions of the parents and that the interest for a real participatory governance might be lessened and even that the time available to play this role would be uh, made impossible because of all the time dedicated to collect additional resources for the school. Another suggestion is to prioritize the tasks assigned to the SMCs and monitor the use of financial and material resources and maybe not manage them, just to monitor them. That could be a first priority. And the design and the monitoring of the school development plan could also be a second priority, given it's a mobilizing power when it comes to the commitment of the stakeholders, but probably according to simplified modalities, which are not the, the ones you see in the training modules or in the, in the implementation tools. The role of teachers is 
I must say, absent in these uh, uh, studies, the role of teachers in SMCs as uh, players uh, uh, familiar with the, upper, the, the functioning of the school and who are not the school principals. They could play a role that would be different from that of the parents and the principals and could be a third party in the relationship between the parents and the uh, principals. The necessity to multiply the, the information channels of, for SMC members and the community at large. The other presentations today and yesterday gave us some possible tools, but the mass media, generally speaking, the tools like a school dashboards could, could also be used, such as a possible integration into the administrative information circuit of the SMCs or therefore their president. So these are solutions that could be envisaged and developed. And once again, <coughs> you have to support the members, the, the SMC members and encourage them to play their role because you cannot do just as if you did not know that the ministries of education have um, uh, a lot of problems uh, just training the teachers and you could try to find innovative modalities in addition to the conventional training so peer support uh, uh, would be used by the smcs and the development of local federations smc federations could be a good uh, uh, relay and another point which is quite a new point is the, the need to rethink the accountability of smc members including those who are not principals or civil servants based on the responsibilities that transferred uh, to them mainly if they have a direct uh, resource management uh, responsibilities and not just monitoring and control responsibilities so these are really briefly all these elements regarding the uh, uh, smc's efficiency and the problems regarding accountability and i'm here uh, ready to answer your question with great pleasure if you have any Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for the very, very comprehensive presentation. Uh, we understand, uh, of course, the the value and the contributions of the SMP uh, in relation to, let's say, the as you've said, one of the recommendations uh, posed by the study is about their participation in the development or in the school development plan so uh, that is really a crucial point that uh, we and i realized uh even the, the experience of the philippines of the department of education really uh the school improvement plan really is very very vital in terms of uh, the uh how the school could be able to to reach out and then uh, the citizens or the stakeholders primarily participate in, in uh, looking into the formulation in, as well as the implementation of the, the school improvement plan. And so you have an equivalent of the school development plan in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, I guess uh, with that, uh, we can have already our discussion for uh, this session. Um, may we call our uh, discussion and then she is uh, uh, Hannah, if I say it correctly, is one of the program managers of Renlock. It's an NGO uh, based in Burkina Faso and uh, she works with the, our uh, Friend who happens to be in this pose at the moment, uh, Floor Samda. So the Renlock and uh, where Hana works with is about uh, looking into and monitoring the anti corruption in, in, in Burkina Faso. So let's all welcome Hana. Thank you very much. On vous voit bien, Aruna. Vous êtes oui, bien. See you. Even though uh, it's not very clear, but we can see you and we can hear you. 
Well, thank you very much. I would like to thank the forum and Muriel for allowing these exchanges. And since, and as the moderator said, my colleague Flora was supposed uh, to uh, attend this forum, but she had some health problems. And therefore, I will be making a, a short work for presentation contribution regarding the RENLAC, which is an organization of Society based in Burkina Faso, carrying out awareness uh, uh, actions and uh, also actions uh, to fight corruption in Burkina Faso. What I need to say is that both uh, presentations uh, concern uh, uh, interesting themes, and I think that, that, that this is what we've been discussing since yesterday in connection with the government in uh, the education sector, i.e. improved governance in this sector, which is a, a very important social sector in our society. So the first uh, communication highlighted key elements which everybody uh, has mentioned, such as transparency, citizens' participation, accountability, and more particularly institutionalization through uh, the social audit in India. At my level, I uh, ask myself a legitimate question either link between these different elements and the relationship between transparency, accountability, citizens' participation and involvement. And we can see through the development that in the education sector, as well as in other sectors, administrative uh, leaders from the central or local governments uh, set up uh, uh, transparency mechanisms and accountability mechanisms with uh, uh, communication means that are well adapted. And if the administrative uh, leaders in the central and local governments uh, develop uh, transparency mechanisms and accountability mechanisms uh, with uh, assorted with, uh, by uh, coming with communication needs which are adapted to the public targeted, this may lead to uh, citizen involvement. And the population in this case uh, can take interest in what the local central governments or, or uh, leaders, administrative leaders uh, do in terms of activities. But nowadays, uh, there is a real gap between what is said and what is done. A lot of uh, local and central governments uh, 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 except that there's a mechanism of transparency, accountability, and uh, citizen involvement. But in the, the facts, in reality, there is no real or actual will, willingness uh, to allow these things to take place. So conversely, if we have uh, populations which are who are well mobilized and who try to ask of uh, the, 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 the government to be accountable and report, this may uh, lead them to uh, introduce this transparency and accountability. So there may be a causal link between uh, transparency on the one hand and accountability, and on the other hand, citizen uh, involvement. In other words, uh, transparency and accountability may lead to citizen involvement, just like the citizen involvement may lead to uh, developing accountability uh, and transparency mechanisms. All in all, this leads to more credibility for public actions and more confidence and more trust uh, between the uh, government and the ones uh, who are governed. But there is one thing I'm taking home through Kirat's communication, which is that for social audits to be fruitful and successful, it is important to discuss between the, the, the stakeholders and the public uh, actors and cooperate rather than uh, just uh, uh, work in a confrontational situation. This is something that has been developed in India, but it is a big problem. It's a major challenge. And this uh, cooperation is uh, more important than anything, more than confrontation, because as we have seen in uh, Joe, when Jonathan uh, in Jonathan's contribution, the SMCs 
experience proved that right, that stakeholders have may have different interests so to cooperate may lead to uh, major difficulties and the, the the political uh, element is also present uh, because you have people who have different interests. You have people who uh, just uh, uh, are in favor of uh, other uh, things. So this is some uh, situation or a condition rather, which is absolutely necessary to lead to successful social audits. What came out of that is uh, the, that the process is uh, that this SFC is a good experience, which leads to the involvement of the community in the management of education. But you nevertheless have to take note of the fact that, that so far the power remains in the hands of the administration. The community or the power of the communities remain limited because in many communities in the, uh, the sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of people are illiterate and you have people who are involved but who do not have the skills to understand what is being said. And you know that the SMCs have a budget and when you pr 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 propose a budget, you discuss the budget and if you have do not have a, a certain knowledge, you cannot efficiently contribute at this level. Uh, in my country, in Burkina Faso, for instance, if you take and the um, higher the secondary uh, schools, the secondary schools, the, uh, the, uh, the, the principal of the school is the president of the SMC. And uh, the president of the Parents Teachers Association is the uh, 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 vice president and the treasurer is a member. And uh, the, uh, the, the the, uh, the members of the school may manage uh, the resources of the uh, SMCs. And so it's a local member who is the president of the SMC. So, so the, 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 the assembly is just made up of the people who are members of the SMC. Sorry, but the interpreter doesn't hear anything. It seems that the connection is frozen. I think we've lost Mr. Sinon. Yes, also you're back, we can hear you. No. No. No, it was Paolo who confirmed that we've lost uh, Mr. Sino. Well, ex ex uh, yes, excuse me, Tess. I think we've lost Mr. Sino, but since uh, we're a bit late, maybe we could take one or two questions if we have people uh, in the public who would like to make a, a comment on what we've heard, and then we could move on uh, to the conclusion of this day, uh, if you agree. Yeah, so um, may we request we... our representatives um, from uh, the um, countries we have, uh, say, I, I don't want to make a roll call here, but for those who would like to volunteer, you're most welcome. And uh, you may share, or you can react uh, to the presentations, or you may share your experience uh, on uh, the subject social audit. Thank you. So uh, let's hear from you. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I was. Yeah, I lost my connection, but I'm back, says Mr. Stino. Okay, so you're back, okay. I don't remember where I stopped uh, when my connection stopped. You were talking about uh, the limits, uh, the limited skills of the uh, SMC members, uh, including when it comes to understanding a budget. If you could just conclude in one or uh, wrap up in one or two minutes, Aruna, so that we can take uh, one or two questions uh, 
uh, from the public. But of course, uh, the floor is yours now. As I said, it's a governance model that should lead to more transparency, but unfortunately, we have noted that the SMC is where the funds are misused. We have this uh, negative experience with SMCs, unfortunately, but despite all that, in the schools, they exist. Uh, sorry, the sound is really poor. And in terms of that problems hearing. What I can say, if you allow me to conclude now, the success of failure uh, is depend on the people who are in charge. And maybe the communicators uh, could or the speakers ex could explain if in the service carried out, the influence of uh, the leaders uh, is, is important regarding uh, such experiences and the participation, the involvement of the citizens. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, um, Ms. Anna, are you, um, do you have any additional uh, information to share? Oui, le Togo, Charlie du Togo. Yes, Charlie from Togo. Yes, um, welcome. From Can Togo. you switch on your uh, camera? Merci. Okay, thank you. I just would like to add a few things and say that in Togo, we have the same experience with the SMCs in primary schools and secondary schools but we went beyond the management uh, uh, of the school and investments or so, so the building of uh, uh, in classrooms uh, were uh, entrusted to the smcs uh, and the result was uh, quite good and it allowed us uh, to monitor the situation because very often and the, uh, the, the, the old building is not necessarily, building work is not necessarily done properly in the community. People are not trained and they're not technicians, but it is true that when you ask them what is needed to build a new classroom, uh, uh, cement and uh, stones, uh, the, the, so they understand so much and that the, this uh, experience worked very well in my country, in Togo. And according to my experience, uh, the principal is not the president, but is the secretary. And a teacher is elected by the other teachers and the head of the village has a representative. And you regularly have to report to the chief of the village. The uh, Parents Teachers Association appoints uh, the president of the SMC. So we have uh, some experiences which are more or less successful, but it does not mean that, that they're, all, they're necessarily 100% successful because we have this misuse of funds uh, with the complicity of other members of the SMC. I believe it would be a good thing, nevertheless, to develop tools uh, to build their uh, capacity and skills, uh, the skills of the community so as to support us because the government uh, uh, itself cannot control everything up to the level of the school, but it would be a, a good thing to see what are the tools which need to be developed and updated to support uh, the SMC so that the community could play its role in the management of our schools. Thank you. Thank you very much, our friend from Togo. Um, any more volunteers who would want to share or react to the presentation? You may raise your hand uh, so we can see who would like to speak. Thank you.
All right. So, uh, yeah, Jonathan. Yes. Uh, oui, peut-être pour rebondir sur quelques. Yes, I would like to return to some of the points that were raised. Uh, concerning the fact that many of the things continue to be the responsibility independent upon the main uh, the main people in authority and the uh, communities and the uh, parents need capacity building so that they can play their role uh, in spite of everything, so to speak. So it does seem that the solution is a shared one both things are needed. And one of the conclusions of the study was that whatever happens, you have to engage uh, the main uh, people in charge, the school heads, uh, and uh, to make them aware and to make them uh, aware of the fact that it's in their interest that these uh, SMCs uh, work well, because they will always be have primary responsibility, they'll have prerogatives and ability to act at their level. So they have to be engaged in the process. They have to embrace it. And there are tools so that all of these uh, actors will find their own interest in the process. But there's also the need to support the communities because to get a community involved when there are problems, it's a huge amount of work that's uh, request of the head of school who has to put in place all kinds of uh, mechanisms for communication and support. And this is on top of his uh, traditional uh, conventional academic and administrative responsibilities. So it can be difficult to deploy all of this. So there's supporting the community is necessary, but because we'll always have uh, heads of school or people who are in uh, positions of authority who will never see this interference in their professional space with a, in a good way. So uh, the communities have to be able to engage in the process uh, independently. And then the whole question is, how do you do it with what resources? If you're talking about uh, micro multiple capacity building, especially given, you know, a very vast territory and knowing that there's also a lot of uh, capacity building already taking place. So any alternative resources, for instance, the NGOs are a very important factor uh, to, to be a source of support. And they can in fact be the main actor in the field who can uh, support the communities. At the same time, we should not uh, minimize the role of local structures, for instance, the Federation of uh, PTAs or possible federations of SMCs that might have been created. But then again, their mission has to be defined with, on the one hand, the uh, school administration, on the other hand, the PTAs. Where could these federations, where would they stand? And then there are other types of networks that could be outside of the schools, uh, outside of the uh, education sector there could be networks for uh, community support within civil society who could be entrusted with uh, the mission of conducting this kind of support and with the kinds of solutions that those uh, entities and structures know how to do because they they look locally they're close to the what's going on, on the ground they are experienced they know how to conduct this kind of support uh, efforts so there's a requirement on both sides and it does require very specific strategies vis-a-vis uh, -vis the both sides. All right, thank you, Jonathan. I see uh, the hand of uh, Kiran. Any, any inputs, Kiran, please? Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to also add to the point raised about, uh, you know, that ultimately the levers of power really lie with the administration or with the government officials. Uh, and that is, of course, true in, uh, uh, you know, it is a fact. Uh, but what our study showed was that very often, especially those who are at the lower end of the, you know, administration of the bureaucracy, they actually feel uh, 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 quite frustrated themselves. Uh, partly because they do not have a lot of power to bring about, you know, all the changes that might be required, but also partly because, uh, you know, their relationship with the community has been 
over the years uh, sort of has broken down in a sense there is a lot of uh, mistrust uh, that has come into come into that relationship uh, and uh, you know the community also might sometimes sort of approach them in a much more hostile fashion so if once these more collaborative um, kind of uh, bridges or, or you know are developed and the relationship starts to build on trust and local solutions are found then even the uh, uh, officials actually feel uh, they get a sense of satisfaction or fulfillment in having done something uh, positive rather than just being at the receiving end both from higher ups in the bureaucracy as well as from the community and that really goes a long way in bridging the kind of gap between uh, you know the officials or the leaders uh, and the people in the communities just even very small things can sometimes make them also feel uh, more empowered in a sense and more willing to um, explore solutions together with the community yeah, thank you for for those additional inputs all right uh, i can i don't see any hands anymore so uh, can we go to the conclusion now all right uh, allow me to make some concluding remarks for this right. session uh, the valuable insight shared by our panelists and discussants undoubtedly enabled us to take stock of where we are now and what have we done what have we been doing with the programs to deliver services to our learners to the students to the teachers and the other stakeholders in particular and the community in general while imbibing the principles of transparency, accountability, and participation. There is no one size fits all in these endeavors and practices. The learnings and takeaways from the sharing can guide us in reviewing, reprogramming, recalibrating our programs and resources to deliver the services where they are needed most in a timely manner. You and I, as open government practitioners, have a common goal of providing opportunities for citizens to participate in ways that will improve or transform the lives of the learners, our students, the teachers, school authorities. In order to involve them in the decision making, we need to reach them in the first place. A variety of tools and platforms have been developed in recent years. They encourage and help people get involved in programs and projects of general interest. They equip the citizens with information and provide them with platforms to directly interact with the decision makers. They strengthen citizens' politics. However, the use of digital tools for monitoring public services also poses challenges that need to be addressed. Among these are the lack of technological access, the lack of technological literacy. People don't know how to use the platform and lack of enthusiasm to learn. People are daunted by technology. These are basically some issues that are encountered particularly at community-based monitors. To achieve education goals involves shared and collective responsibility and accountability. This requires effort from all actors. Therefore, it is important to ensure accountability at all levels in the education system and promote positive relationships among various actors in the system. Lastly, the COVID-19 pandemic has generated the surge of public demand for government transparency and accountability, as well as citizen participation. This pandemic respects no boundaries, and we have a lot to learn from it. However, it should not deter you and me from moving forward because education must compete, as has been our battle cry in the Philippines. This especially in this time of a pandemic, 
that wherever you are, across the globe, the goals and objectives of both in government and education need to be sustained in spite of all the odds. The only positive factor that we can accept in these unprecedented times is that the pandemic allows all actors from government, civil society, and the private sector to reshape the transparency, accountability, and participation initiatives. The way we advance and utilize access to information, identify and combat corruption in different ways. Our pathways to open government in education may be an uphill struggle, but we will master the courage to reach out our goal with citizen participation. Never to shrink that civic space for open government practitioners. Again, we thank our panelists and discussants, Dr. Rosanna Hash, Dr. David Duque, Bien Cortez, Kiran Bati, Jonathan Dupan, our uh, friend Hannah, and of course to Dr. Rosan for joining us in today's session and for those. Uh, behind the camera, our IT duty of the IITP, Camila, Ramon, and the rest. So, if I may say now, that concludes our panel discussion. Test of here, your moderator signing off. And see you again tomorrow for another session. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mm. Bye. Thank you, Tess. Mm. Thank you, Maria. Bye. Au revoir. Au revoir.